Yeah, so thank you all for yeah. coming. I think we'll get started. I don't know anymore, man. Um, You're missing a mic. No, I got it. Maybe I'll ask each of our guests to introduce themselves in turn, but I thought I'd start off with a question. I'm Ken Shapworth, by the way. I'm chair of the Jazz Studies Department. And um, I, I remember seeing Jackie when I was a student. I was at NEC 82 to 84. But I think it was really just the end of his teaching here, and I really didn't interact with him very much, I'm sad to say. Uh, that my, my best memory, actually, is hearing his band play at Michael's Pub. I was here in the summer of 79. And they played every week. And it was literally a block away from here. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'll never forget his playing his, on piano. Just the spirit of the band. I've tried to communicate a little of that to our big band, but it's impossible. Like, <laughs> when you see it and you experience it, I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. It's, it's something you can't put in words, you know, I guess you can hear it in the recordings to some degree, but uh, I'm, I'm glad I had that experience. So, Carl Atkins, maybe I'll start with you and maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and also your experience with Jackie. When, when did you first meet him? You know, uh, yeah, anything you want to say about Jackie? <laughs> Oh, I should say Carl was also the first chair of the Jazz Studies Department. I'm really honored to have him back here. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, well, I first heard Jackie play music um, in about 69, in 1969, actually at Lenny's on the Turnpike. Uh, he had a trio. Um, quartet, and um, um, my feeble brain tends to forget specific things. But anyway, I just remembered his playing. And I had heard him perhaps in, in, in moments uh, with the Mingus Band and, and with other kinds of things that he was doing in the late, late 60s and early 70s. And <clears throat> when Gunther Schuller asked me to help him form um, a jazz studies program. We actually, I was just having a, a, a little discussion with uh, a group of African American students who are here at, at NEC, and we were talking about a little bit about the derivation of the title, the name of the program, and so forth and so on. And I know that there are discussions going on, but but uh, Gunther wanted to start a jazz studies program, and I I I think I not taking wanting to take credit where credit isn't due, but but I think I. Um, to talk to him at length about wanting to have an Afro-American music studies program. So we compromised and called it the Department of Afro-American Music and Jazz Studies, which was which was fine. And uh, but that name has changed over over time, some for good reasons, and maybe some for not. But the point is that that uh, I suggested to Gunther that we needed uh, a strong pianist. Uh, to teach in the jazz program and someone who, who was a writer, who was a composer. And Jackie came, came, came to mind right away. And uh, Gunther invited him to come up and we met and uh, we hired him. And this was in 1972, I think. I'm gonna forget the specifics, like I said, but in 1972, he came on board. And uh, you know, he was, as you'll hear, a singular, in kind of individual, a singular kind of musician, uh, followed his own muse uh, to the nth degree, uh, but always uh, with uh, an eye and an ear uh, to quality, but he always wanted to have fun. He always, I mean, humor, humor was also always a big part of who Jackie Byard was musically and otherwise, so I think you have to always talk about that. And I think as you hear various recounts from people here on the panel of their relationship or involvement with uh, Jackie, you'll hear lots of humor uh, coming out. So um, we'll talk more. So Jason Moran. Yeah, I was a, a student of Jackie Byard's from 1993 to 97. Uh, moved from Houston to New York specifically to study with Jackie Byard because Jackie was the pianist in a band, in that Mingus band that seemed to have both their strong fist in the air and that music was wild. And 
And he seemed to want to cover the historic scope of black representation at the piano. And he didn't even limit it to America either, so he went everywhere. Um, and when I got to New York, his band was playing at, uh, I think it's called Trumpets in New Jersey, I think that's what it's called. Mm. And so my friends and I went out to see the big band play. And I see this Frederick Douglass-like mane of hair <laughs> flowing back. And I hear this music that jumps off the bandstand as if I'm in a circus or something, you know? He's got whistles, plastic whistles on the, on the piano, and his hands are going everywhere, and the entire band also is in that energy. And I thought, that's gonna be my teacher. <laughs> it's a little, and I went up to him and I, and I introduced myself and said, I'm looking forward to studying with him. And the next four years couldn't be more life-changing than every Monday sitting side by side with him and just going through music, going through history, uh, going through technique, and a lot of it he taught through his own repertoire. I have one of the first things he gave me in the lesson, and this will kind of show you what, how, what his attitude was towards, towards education. He gave me a list of what he called the shuns. <laughs> and shuns are all these words that end in T-I-O-N. <laughs> and so I'll read the first few. Abdication, aberration, abortion, absolution, abstraction, abstraction, accretion, <laughs> accumulation, action, activation, addiction, ad adjudication. Right? It goes on through every letter. <laughs> wow. That was his first lesson. He's like, yeah, read this. And he, this, these are the shuns, Chase, these are the shuns. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, you know? Like, so he wasn't taking any, anything for granted, the sound, the meaning, and he seemed to turn all that around on the piano. And it's one of the, the treasured moments of my life was spending those Mondays with him in New York. So Jed Levy is also joining us. Um, I, I met Jackie here at uh, New England Conservatory when I was a student from 77 through 81. And uh, I was a, very much aware of his music because of his participation um, in the music of Charles Mingus. And at the time, around 1976, for the, the musicians that I was running with in New Jersey, there were a, a couple Mingus records that made such a profound impression on us, Changes One and Changes Two. And even though Jackie was no longer a, a member of Charles Mingus's group at that point, um, just like prior to, you know, like listening to Miles Davis, it led me to all the musicians that played with Miles Davis. And so I, it was like a, a, a vector point, a start for me, as was Mingus. So I, I was uh, highly aware of Mingus's music and his part uh, uh, participation in it. And when I got here, um, I honestly don't remember how I ended up in his Michaels band. I, I remember subbing, and then all of a sudden they said, oh, you're gonna play this, you're in the band now. And I'm like, okay. And I felt so far in over my head. I was just, I was just like, I can't believe, why do they want me here? This is, so, this, I'm looking at this music, this is really hard. I don't know if anybody's ever looked at um, like some of Jackie's music Jackie, uh, probably maybe Jackie and Gunther Schuller are possibly the only two people that could really, that I met, that could really notate Charlie Parker's ballad phrasing accurately, rhythmically. And what that looks like, it, you know, like you could present this to a classical violinist and theoretically get very, something very close to that phrasing, but it means that whole bars under brackets of six subdivided down to 30 second notes. And as, a, as like a green kid out of Jersey, I was just like, oh my God, what is this? This is beautiful. But anyways, we, so my, my relationship with him initially was actually just having the good fortune to be in his, his band, the one that played at Michael's every week. And, I remember early on we ended up like one night we did the gig and then we went to WGBH and recorded a whole record in the middle of the night, like starting at like one in the morning. And this is like, you know, before I even knew which, which end was up. So he was, um, 
and he was really wonderful. He, uh, he was so supportive. Um, my f in the old dorm across the street here, um, they used to give Jackie a suite upstairs, and one of, one of our, my friends also had a room on that floor. So we'd be up there listening to records, and Jackie would come by, and we would just spend like the whole night talking, drinking wine, playing records. We'd be asking him about, oh, what about like, you know, Miss Ann, do you know, do you, what was that record date like with Dolphy and all this stuff? And, and, and he was just, it, it was like hanging out with, you know, one of our peers in a way, but of course we had much more respect, but he, he made us feel comfortable like, like, like we were, you know, around his thing. And, the other thing I just want to say uh, about him is I've been very fortunate to meet and to play with a, a great many great musicians. But of the people, I would say, I think there might only be two people that I would not hesitate to use the word genius. And Jackie Byard is definitely one of those people. And it goes beyond you know, his piano playing, his writing, his just, he, he looked at nature and made music out of it. I know that sounds really broad, but I mean, he was into things like numerology. He would, he would, he would say, he'd play something at the piano, he goes, that's you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? That's your phone number. <laughs> you know what I mean? He knew that, like, and, and the, the other person I would say that I met on that level, the only other person that I would say that deep was Hermeto Pasquale. And both of them, they, it just, it's not just to be, you know, one, I mean, he was one of the greatest piano players in the world, Jackie. But he had a vision that was completely global long before any of us were thinking like that. So, and Hermeto was the same way. I mean, this guy would come on stage with a pig and make music on a pig, you know? I mean, it's incredible what, you know, these guys were thinking on a whole, whole nother frequency, not just great musicians, they were beyond that, like visionaries, and he was one of them. Thank you. <laughs> so, another question I have is about his teaching, and uh, I guess Jason got into this a little bit, but, Jed, you... Studied I did with him, and Carl, you were his department chair, I guess. Um, as someone who did not study with him in that kind of direct way, I'm curious if you could tell us a little more about what, you know, what the focus of that teaching was. Maybe a few more examples. Yeah. Carl, do you want to start off? Well, yeah. As Ken said, I never actually. Uh, studied with Jackie in a, in a formal way. I mean, I never had weekly lessons and those kinds of things, but I did, did have occasions to, uh, to play with him, sometimes with him just at the piano and me on, on the saxophone. And uh, I learned so much from watching and hearing what he did, even though I didn't understand a lot of it. And he was the first person really to help me understand uh, what was happening with uh, with bebop, with 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 the idea of of uh, why contrafacts worked, but how they were work, working from upper partials on chords and things like that, I didn't, you know, at at 24 years old, 23 years old, I was still, you know, hacking around trying to not get lost in the blues, and uh, he, you know, he opened my ears, and most many times he opened my ears by things he said rather than things that he that he did. And I think that Jed's comments about him, you know, just being connected with nature. I mean, Jackie, <clears throat> Jackie was the classic example, again, of a human being, I guess, in, in, uh, in, in various cultures, he'd be called a minch. You know, he just, <laughs> you know, he, he, um, he was a painter, he was an illustrator, you know, and again, we've all heard stories, and some of us have actually heard him play many, many instruments. We talk about him as a pianist, and certainly as a pianist, non parallel. But uh, you know, he played trombone and he played saxophone at a level and with a certain kind of stylistic bent that uh, that I wish I'd had. You know, and I mean, I'd played saxophone many, many years 
uh, when I first heard him play, and I thought I thought it was going to be a joke because, again, humor uh, always seemed to be a part of, of Jackie's life, and he, sometimes you had to be careful that you didn't um, you didn't fall prey in, in, into one of his humor traps, you know, because I mean, so, sometimes he'd lay things on you, and you'd be going, "Oh yeah, that's right," and then you'd go, "Wait a minute, what is that?" <laughs> but that was Jackie, you know. But he always had he always had something happening there, and and I learned a tremendous amount just just from being around him. And Jed was talking about you know being respectful, uh, and of course we all were. But when we first brought him to the conservatory, I mean, and I, and I never got a chance to follow up and ask him this question, but he was teaching upstairs uh, in one of the rooms, and I, I had not actually, we'd hired him, but I hadn't actually formally talked to him. And so I stood outside of the studio where he was teaching, and I forgot who the student was. It might have been Alan Pasqua or somebody like that. But anyway, so when he got through, I wanted to say hello and introduce myself to him again. I had met him in New York once, so he had no reason to know me particularly. And But he came out, and I said, hey, Jackie, how are you? Carl Atkins, I'm glad to have you. He said, oh, man. I said I'm so sorry, man. I didn't recognize you, man. You, I should, I, you, you know, you, you, yeah, you, you, you're somebody I ought to know all the time, you know. And I, I'm standing there. I'm like, you know, this kid with nothing going for him, and here's Jackie Byard, and he's being so deferential that it was, you know, it was unbelievable. And he stayed that way all the time that I knew him, no matter how long we knew each other and how many things we did together and talked about things. He still you know, exhibited this sort of deferential attitude. And sometimes I think it was a put on, sometimes I think it was serious. I think it was always serious, but I think sometimes he did it in the context of some humor rather than, 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 than actually, you know, trying to, 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 uh, to just be deferential for the sake of it. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> he was one of a kind, there's no doubt. Jason? I think one, so Jackie would come to lessons and have these two, what I call like Old Testament and New Testament, which were massive volumes of his own transcriptions of his own piano playing. And so he had decoded Stride Piano for the masses, mm -hmm. for his students basically. Mm -hmm. and, and he'd bring them and he'd put them, lunk them onto the piano and then he'd pull out a piece and then he'd look at it. And they kind of range between Something historic, like, okay, let's play this, right? Or something like, here's a phrase that Tatum would play, and I've transposed it four times for you to see. Or it's an exercise. So he used to talk about his hand not really being that big. So he had these exercises that I've showed many of my students about how to open the hand up. And he said, you don't want to lose energy wasting your hand, having it move away from the keys. So he always found this way to keep his hands on the key. The key is this long. Many pianists use only the bottom end of the piano. And because his hand was small, he found, like he taught me then, that your finger can actually go to the very top of the key and be playing that note. It doesn't have to be down there at the bottom, but you get more spread that way when you use your body. So he kind of had this awareness, not only of the body's relationship to the piano, of the history that he wanted his students to gather, I mean, the humor part was fun, but if a student came in late, the curse out was immediate. <laughs> like, it was immediate. He was not necessarily an easy teacher. And I also watched many of my friends not study with him because of this very reason. Um, and they were looking for what they thought was something new. I didn't want anything new. I needed that knowledge bank. And he was the only one that I felt like was in that moment when I, what I was looking for that had that knowledge bank, but also was willing to write it down and share it slowly, you know? And so he didn't ever expect me to, to understand it all. And that was also the great, he gave me so much music that I'm still going through, it's been 25 years since I studied with him, that I'm still like going through and opening and, and, and looking at like, you know, but also that I'm glad you mentioned the part about his illustration and also his kind of multi-instrumental style, instrumental style, because he, didn't necessarily see the musician only as a relationship to the instrument. He clearly wanted to get students on the bandstand, not talk about it, do, do it, you know? And that is frightening if you're not ready. But I think he was really ready to push you out front to do that. Mm -hmm. The one thing he reminded me of was, you know, like, 
He said, you know, you out here trying to rush. I asked him, like, do I, should I make a demo? Much like many students in, his, in here ask. He said, I didn't make my first record till I was 38. You know, like, solo record, you know? He's born 1922, like he's getting going though, in like 58, 59, 60s, when he's making his first, first dates, his first solo statements. And so he was like, you just gotta be patient. He said, you don't have nothing to play about anyway. <laughs> it was very, you know, like he was real that way. And it kind of like, it was perfect to put me in check. And then when I started recording, I would always send him the record to listen to and be like, what do you think? You know, like, please give me the, give me the real on what this is. And yeah, but he's still always my barometer for the piano, just because he was able to access it all. But, and then he knew how to talk about it too, you know, in his own way. Yeah. I just have one follow-up question. So I assume he would play in your lessons, Jason. I mean, was there a certain amount of the pedagogy that was just listening or, or yeah. showing? Also, you know, also the pedagogy around two pianists playing together too. It was a whole thing. So when I got out of school, I was able to play with Mary McPartland. I was able to play with Uri Kane, right? Like I was able to play with other pianists because Jackie whipped me into shape for four years about how that role really works. Hmm. So he did it with Earl Hines. He did it with Rand Blake, you know? Like he has this relationship of how to do the two piano thing. Um, but yeah, it was like, he'd play it, then I'd play it. And then in the second time, let's say we were playing a tune, then he'd go further out and he would try to drag you further out into the ocean <laughs> on a tune. He would just keep pulling it, and then you'd be like, well, okay, now I'm drowning. And then he'd say, okay, let's stop, you know? But it was, but he wanted to tempt you, but he also needed you to be thinking about what was happening in the moment, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of what Jason just said really resonates with me. I, I, did, I did study with him for, um, guess about a semester. Uh, I was, uh, one of the main reasons I came to NEC was actually the saxophone teacher, Joe Allard, who, uh, you know, was not a jazz uh, person, but, but was an incredible saxophone pedagogue and just basically helped you get what you wanted out of the saxophone in order to try and use it in a musical way. That what you did with it was, was up to you. But, but, um, a lot of, you know, Jackie was, um, he, ha I guess one thing I, I, that from what Jason was saying, he, he had a very strong moral sense about him, not only in terms of like loyalty to people like musicians or people that, you know, had been with him, but he also had a very strong code of ethics about what the music industry should be. And this was, I mean, right now, if this was if he presented what he had to say on that, it would shock people because he is ex he was exactly the opposite of what we're all either possibly being taught or being forced into in order to try and make music out there. He he really he he thought that your talent should bring it. You shouldn't go after anything, mm -hmm. you know? And he was really, he was very adamant about that. And, um, and he would get very uncomfortable if he saw other people like kind of like, as we call it today, hustling really hard to get over. He just thought, no man, when, you, when you're, and I think it ties into what you were saying about like, you know, when you're ready, you're gonna, you know, at, at, he just was like, yeah, that, I mean, he would, you know, he would get very upset about this, this aspect of it. And I, and as a young impressionable person, I mean, morally and in my heart, I totally agreed with him, but I knew the reality is there has to be a balance, you know, in order to survive. And, and the world had changed a lot since he was, like making his bones, if you will, you know, it's a lot bigger. And so my, the way I looked at it, just for myself, I said, when someone does something for you, like, you know, encourages you in a way that like they try and help you, you have to get a hundred or a thousand percent behind that. Because if they're doing that in today's world, 
And if they're doing it to, to me, that means I have to like respond a thousandfold and do everything I can to make that, you know, if they believed in me enough to say, go, you know, I talked to this guy about you, you should go and talk, to, you know, call him up. Then you have to do it, man. I mean, I, I, I personally, I'd rather go hide under the bed, but that's part of the respect of somebody, you know, like somebody saying, somebody like Jackie saying, yeah, go do this, you should do this. So that, that, that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say, hopefully we'll leave a little time for questions. If you have questions, I'd love to entertain that. And I, I think maybe there's a way for people online to submit their questions. I'm not 100% sure. Is that true, Kelly? <laughs> so uh, Kelly will get it to me somehow through my phone. But um, I have one more sort of open-ended question, which is, uh, I mean, I don't know how many of you know about his life, but he grew up in Worcester. So it's a city uh, west of Boston. Um, lived in Boston for some time, moved to New York City. Uh, I mean, he had a significant career, but I think I, I've heard from a lot of musicians who were frustrated that he was not better known as a uh, pianist, or maybe his, uh, his genius, as you put it, Jed, was not recognized by all. And I was thinking, hearing you talk, Jason, and also uh, Jed, uh, maybe that was part of his own, you know, fault in a way by not hustling. <laughs> I, I guess I'm, 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 I'm not. I'm just. No, no. I, and, and, and I, I felt the same thing. I felt the same thing at times. You and know, and I, I guess I, I'm just going to take one. And this is maybe a leap, but. Um, you know, did he talk about race and how that affected him mm. growing up in Worcester? I'm just trying to imagine what that must have been like living in Boston for as, as many years as he did. Uh, how might that have impact him, impacted him? You know, if it did, I'm not, I'm not going to theorize, but, but I'm curious to know your own impressions on, you know, sort of the his life or you know his career from that perspective uh, and I'm grateful by the way that he's done all these things that he's done the recordings of course I've been listening to recently and and his big band music I'll, I'll say one more thing you know I go to these conferences and usually there's uh, someone from essentially Ellington I don't know if you know but every year they publish these charts and they give them out free to high school bands every time I say one year you should just do Jackie Byard's music uh, it's great music. It's not actually that difficult. You know, er, high, a good high school band can play Aluminum Baby. Mm -hmm. They should play Aluminum Baby, uh, but they're not. You know, and, and usually it's like, Jackie Bard? Who's that? Can you remind me? <laughs> what did he do? And, and, and it's frustrating for me, I guess. And uh, so, I don't know, Carl, if you have any insight. Sorry, it's a very broad question, but what, what is your take on that, the direction, I guess, of his career? Well, uh, are you asking two questions? You asked one about race and I one about... I guess so. Uh, and they might be related and they might not, I guess, so. <laughs> well, I, I think in, in many ways, I mean, Jackie had his ways uh, to deal with the race race issue. You know, I mean, he was in an interracial marriage. I don't know if you knew Louise. Uh, he was a wonderful person in his... Her parents didn't like Jackie. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, but, you know, Jackie didn't, they didn't let that get in the way of what was a profound love for each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so I think, you know, Jackie's take on it all was, <clears throat> he just wanted to know if you could play music. I mean, if you, if, if you could make that happen, he, didn't, he, he was of no mind to worry about whether you were white, black, orange, purple, mm -hmm. or whatever. And he also pulled no punches mm -hmm. because you were white, black, orange, or purple. I mean, if you... <laughs> If you didn't play, mm -hmm. if you didn't, if you didn't, if you weren't making the right effort, sometimes you know people you play. We all have done it. You know, you 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 you're trying your best and 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 you don't you don't make it. But people can tell if you're sincere about what you're doing. And Jackie, I think, could always separate mm -hmm. the insincerity. You know, people who were, you know, just uh, shucking. Mm -hmm. 
mm. uh, versus people who were trying hard and maybe not making it happen, but he could tell that they that they were they were sincere about they were, what they were doing. Mm. Uh, but so, so I'm not sure. I, I never really had any conversations with him uh, about raising. As I said, the times we few times we played together, and of course here at the conservatory, you know, we had mm. students of all stripes, and he was uh, equally uh, mm. uh, supportive uh, and. Uh, not supportive of students who weren't making the, the right the right effort. That's all he really wanted. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I remember. Um, I mean, I remember when his wife passed. You know, I was just finishing studying with him and writing him a letter about because I knew his relationship with his Italian wife meant a lot to him about what he learned about life. Mm -hmm. You know, by having a relationship like that. What and it's brave, it's a kind of brave love, you know, um, that he has. Um, that was key to understanding him too. Some of, like I'd say 75% of our lessons were playing and then there were some lessons where we didn't play at all. We only talked, and he only talked about history. He talked about being in the war, you know, mm -hmm. being on the ship, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. hearing another band on another ship, you know. Like he talked about that, or he talked about meeting, you know, being a parent, you know, you know, going over his house, going into his basement, you know, and then kind of not talking about where his parenting went wrong also, you know. So you, when you all talk about like his kind of holistic way of teaching, I would say I learned that from him, mm -hmm. from how he taught, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that he didn't really find like, nah, we're just going to rap about piano. He wanted you to find, and I think all great music and art does this, they want you to find another pathway out of what you've just experienced into your daily, you know, mm -hmm. that'll give you an option. Him talking about all these permutations or talking about words that end with T-I-O-N is about imagination, another shun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's about that, and he, and, he want, and, he, and he wanted to propel you toward it. So like Carl said, he wasn't looking at what you brought as your kind of like, your card to the table as much as he was trying to envision the future one for you. And, it, and, and also, Carl reminds me that people, and I'm sure we all know people like this too, some people who speak enough too much truth, you don't really want them around all the time. <laughs> you know, that sometimes you just be like, man, I don't want to hear all that today, you know, right, right, some, right. sometimes. Let me live in my bubble, man. Yeah. <laughs> but Jackie, you know, he- burst that bubble, man. Yeah, he, he, he wasn't. He wasn't really about that. And I think he and a few of my other teachers, Andrew Hill and Muha Richard Abrams, they all had a certain kind of resistance to the commercialism of the scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, each one of them taught me about it. I may be the worst example of a student. <laughs> like, oh, look at him. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they each taught me a, a certain hesitance toward it and wariness around how a culture can get commercialized. And Andrew's word for it is, I'm not unsung, un, unsung I'm underpromoted. Mm -hmm. And I would say that would be Jackie too. And when you say that thing about him not quite feeling it, you know, you see in that documentary, Anything for Jazz, Bill Evans, so poignantly say at the beginning, you know, like, this is kind of, you know, this is kind of, he's kind of the guy. Mm -hmm. And Ron Carter talking about it too, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think also, I mean, somehow, I mean, I, I, clearly I met Jackie late in his life, but he seemed so at ease to give you all the gold to go make yours. Mm -hmm. And that was, for me, it was, that was powerful. Yeah. Um, you know, as a student here and, and, and working with him, um, I just felt like I was dealing with one person to another. I never, you know, I never felt any kind of uh, racial overtones. He, you know, he knew that I respected and loved him, his music, and him as a person, the way he, he treated people, and he responded in kind. So I never felt anything like that. Um, again, the under-promotion that Jason speaks about, um, some of it was of his own making. I remember we used to speak on the phone a lot because he lived not far from me in Queens. And uh, we, we just call up and talk, and he, I say, hey, Jackie, what's happening? He says, yeah, some guy uh, <laughs> called me, called me uh, about a, a festival in Italy for the big band. And I'm like, great, when is it? When are we going? 
He goes, I didn't return the call. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You didn't return the call. <laughs> he said, and he, there was a pause, and he said, if he's really interested, he'll call back. <laughs> and, you know, on, on one level, that's really profound, because it's right, you know, right? right. I mean, if they, on the other hand, it's all wrong. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Jason, you, you know, we, we, so many generations have gone by between that, you know, hit, where he formed his kind of thinking about the business of music and like where we are now trying to actually make, make anything happen here in this, in this world, that it, it's, it almost sounds funny now, but again, it was like this really strong moral fiber and um, also just to kind of jump back to like his family thing, I mean, you know, that, that tune, Gar, that's his wife's family's name. Right. So, you know, he, whatever they might have felt, he felt familial love for them. I know that. He, you know, he wrote all, all pieces for all, all of his different family members, and he talked about them, and, you know. So. Yeah, and, and you know, again, we talk about <clears throat> when we all came along, I mean, I, I came along a little, a half a generation uh, past you guys and, and before you guys, and Jackie was a half generation ahead of me, but I, I took a lot of his words and his actions uh, to heart. A as I became aware that there was something going on there to learn, I mean, I just, you know, I was young enough and naive enough and, and you know, hip enough that I thought I'd do everything anyway. I mean, you know, I had been around enough people who had been playing the music for a long time, but I remember sharing, this was before Jackie came here, and I don't know if I ever told you about this, Ken, but, but uh, the first gig that I had in Boston after I got here uh, through a long, torturous road that went through an opera company and all kinds of crap, but uh, I was really desperate, I, and I was living in an apartment behind the Berkeley College with uh, three other uh, musicians, and I needed a gig bad. <clears throat> and I don't know whether it was Andy McGee or somebody, maybe it was Larry Monroe or somebody over Berkeley called me and said, hey man, I just got a call about a guy, from a guy who wants a tenor player to play for this gig downtown. And I said, well, fine. You know, I mean, this was 1969. And I said, oh yeah, yeah, man, I, you know, uh, where is it? You know, I didn't even care how much I paid. I was just looking for a gig. He said, yeah, it pays $35, man. You go in and play for two hours. Well, 1969 broke. $35 looked like, you know, <laughs> Fort Knox or something. So <clears throat> I got the directions and got on the green line. I never forgot. Well, I got on the green line. And I wasn't, I never considered myself much of a tenor player. I mean, I played alto and then later on baritone was my horn. But, but uh, it was a gig on tenor. I had one. So I got on the green line and went down and got off at the common stop. What is that? The stop down there. And I walked, you know, a few blocks south, and I was in the middle of what was then known as the combat zone. Now, I didn't know anything. I was new enough to Boston that I didn't know about the combat zone, and I had the address, and I went to this place that was on the corner down there, and it was a strip joint. So I go in, and there's an organ player, and I'll never remember who the guy's name was, but he was playing, and there were strippers walking around the bar. You know, and so I go in, and the organ player never stopped. He said, "Get your horn out, we're in B flat." You know, and blah 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 blah. I get up, I'm playing, and they're walking the bar. So I was kind of humiliated because I'm thinking, "Hey, you know, I'm conservatory trained. I just got from an orchestra job. You know, I'm I played with this person and that person. Here I am playing tenor." which I didn't like, <laughs> play a tenor and a strip joint, but hey, it paid $35. The long and short of it is that uh, I played the gig, got $35, and never went back. But I was telling Jackie this story, and Jackie's only comment was, did you learn anything? I mean, he didn't care. I mean, he, it wasn't whether I was you know, playing some music that I thought I should be playing, or he thought I should be playing, or whatever. He said, did you learn anything? And the upshot of that was, maybe you just learned that you don't want to do that. And that, mm, that, may be, that may be the biggest lesson that you get from it all. But that was Jackie. You know, that was, that was Jackie. 
So if there's anything you're desperate to add, by the way, feel free. I don't want to control it, but also I thought maybe, uh, I know some people have to leave uh, at one. Uh, any questions? Yes, Hankus. <laughs> I think we talked about it, Ken, before when I was trading messages with Diane, his daughter, really about where that archive sits uh, and how intact is that archive, uh, because that archive was massive and well organized, too. Um, it's just a future NEC conversation uh, uh, that I hope, because there are a lot of archives now sitting in people's homes or basements. Uh, and they will disappear if, mm -hmm. you know. Anyway, just as a, you bring up, when you talk about his house, his house felt like a library. You know? Yeah, I mean, I've gone to a lot of trouble. Every time we do these concerts, I was telling Jed, I try to do a new piece, enter it in finale, you know, proofread all the parts yeah. that I can find. I mean, there are usually some missing parts <laughs> to just about any chart I've found. Some scores, some don't have scores. Hank, as I know, we've communicate about, I've gotten a lot from Hankus. But if there's anyone out there, by the way, who has more charts that we don't have in our library, I, I, I feel very passionately that this is music that well, maybe, should, yeah, maybe, should be you know, played. Maybe, I mean, people have started online. I remember feeling a little bit protective, I gotta say. Mm -hmm. Very protective of what he gave me. Mm -hmm. um, just as a student and watching him be murdered. Mm -hmm. I could, I'm still not over that. Mm -hmm. I'm not over it. Um, and so I was protective of what he shared. And some, I remember a few years ago, people, Spike Wilner, I think another pianist in New York, was trying to put together a book of, I think he studied with Jackie too. Mm -hmm. And they started really trying to get the files together. And you know, hear you say this, it does think like, oh, maybe we should just put out the open call and, and really try to amass it. Because it, you know, it, it probably is easily uh, obtained. Well, yeah, and I think there's a right way to do that. I just want to say, and I I, 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 I got the feeling that because of his untimely death and the nature of it, all things around him became much more difficult. At, right after his passing, I know that Paul Jeffrey, who you know we spoke mm. of, he was ready to. He had spoken to Duke University where he was teaching, and they were ready to make an offer mm. to archive Jackie's music. And 
he, you know, he had called me and said, well, you know, can you speak to Diane or whatever? And I said, well, I can put you in touch. You know, I mean, I've known her for a long time, but I, I don't feel that I'm a person to be, I, I, you know, I'd like to see his music be safe and available and played. That's my only in, that. investment in it. But I don't really feel like I'm worthy of being some kind of middle person. But here's her number. You know, I wish you the best of luck. You can feel free to use my name, say that I thought this would be a good thing or whatever you want to do. And there was a lot of weirdness around it. it, was, it and, and I really felt that a lot of it was because he died an unnatural death. And that just put, just cast all this really difficult, bad energy about it. Mm -hmm. But I certainly hope that that music does find its way to safety somewhere and should be played. Because what we know, even me who played with him hundreds of gigs, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. There was stuff he wouldn't dare pull out, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that was just so, I mean, some of the stuff we would get, I mean, it sounded like Shostakovich or something. I mean, it was really profound, you know. And there was a whole Coltrane suite. I don't know what ever happened to that. With, with He called Satellite Moon Man. He had an arrangement of Satellite. And I mean, there was just countless amount of stuff. So I do hope that, um, I mean, an institution like NEC, of course, I think would be one of the best places that it could be housed. But right. I'd, love, I'd love to see it come here. Yeah. I think it would really be great. I mean, he taught a lot of different places. But I think that in a lot of ways, his, his tenure here at NEC was signature in both NEC's life, his life, and the life of this music. And I, I, I'd love to see it, see it come here. And I, I'll be part of any effort uh, to, to, to make that happen. So Ken, Ken that knows that. Good. We're talking, just reminded of, <laughs> again, talking about <clears throat> looking at his music and, and, and some things being incomplete and this, that, or the other. <clears throat> I was talking to Herb Pomeroy after Jackie played in his band and, and, and Jackie left, I'm not, I don't remember all the details of whether he left of his own accord or the other guys in the band, some, some of the guys in the saxophone section didn't like Jackie because they, they didn't like not only the way he played the horn, he played the horn in his own individual way, but they never were sure what he was gonna play because Jackie, as they found out when they brought in a sub, uh, the person to take Jackie's book, uh, he sat down and opened the page and they were blank. Because Jack, Jack had made up his part sometimes as he went along, yeah. and he never wrote it down, you know. Yeah. And so, but it sounded great because Jackie had, had, as you guys know, he had this incredible mind and this incredible ear. Yeah. So he would, you know, he he would make up the second tenor part, and he'd change it from from gig to gig. You know, this time he's going to try this set of harmonies. He's right. going to try this set of, well, but he never wrote it down. So the the second tenor book was always incomplete. Yeah, <laughs> I I know. Uh, at his memorial, somehow I got charged with leading the big band at his memorial at St. Peter's. And I reached out to a bunch of people that I thought might like to be involved in this. And one of them was Herb, although I, I had no contact with him here in Boston. I never met the man, but I knew his reputation. And he couldn't, you know, he, he, he was getting up in years and couldn't make it. But he talked to me for like over an hour about how Jackie had inspired the musicians in Boston. He said he was just light years ahead of anybody. Mm -hmm. He said one time they, they were rehearsing the big band and um, they took a break and Jackie sat down without a score and wrote out a whole arrangement right from his brain. No mm -hmm. score, passed out the parts. They said it was killing, perfect, yeah. you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. And they all just were like, oh man, this, this is like, this is, you know, you can't learn that, you know, that's, 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 that's a God-given mm -hmm. something, you know. So he spoke very highly of yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So any other questions or comments? Yeah, go ahead. I think you, if you if you read the the recent biography, 
uh, talked a lot about the people who influenced him in Worcester. I like to call it Worcester. <laughs> but it, but uh, <clears throat> that influenced him in Worcester, they were musicians, you know. And, and that's sometimes the, 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 the story behind people who, who come out uh, with, uh, with a personality, a musical personality in a life, that the people behind them are often unknown or they are lesser known. They're not people who made big names for themselves. Of course, we know he had an incredible um, uh, love for the pianist who, who, in terms of piano, the pianist who, who preceded him, so I mean, Father Hines and, and Waller. And, I mean, he, he learned, those were his mentors, not necessarily that he sat down with them and talked about how to do this, that, or the other. But those are the people who influenced uh, who he became as a, as a musician, and, it's, and certainly as a pianist. Um, uh, so, so I'm not sure I could answer specifically, but I think if you point back to some of those people who were a part of the, the Sackstrom uh, in, in, in Worcester, you know, that was one of the first uh, musician-run clubs I think they paid three dollars a month or twelve dollars a month or something for this building, mm -hmm. where musicians could come in mm -hmm. and rehearse and play. And and Jackie was in the, in the middle of that. So all of those players, all of those people in Worcester, who were his, you know, who were older than him, who were the next generation, including his father, you know, the, the, they are the people who who mentored Jackie. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, uh, I think in in some regards. Based, based on his style, it's very easy to hear who he liked because he would absorb that style and be able to not only you know, play a facsimile of it, but actually play himself in that style. And even, even as late as um, you know, when I knew him, he was still absorbing other people's music. One time we had a small group rehearsal here, and he brought in this chart, and, and it was called fadism. And I, well, Jackie, what's fadism? What's that, what, what are you talking about? He said, you know, Freddie Hubbard and all them sus chords. <laughs> and, and, and that's what it was. It was like a lot of like modern usage of pentatonics, but his, he had digested the information and yeah. remade it in his own in his, uh, so I have, a, I have an illustration of, of, the, of the cover of Fadism that, yeah, he, that he drew. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 Fadism. <laughs> but yeah, that's what he said. Yeah, he said, you know, I mean, it was like all the sort of contemporary, he had synthesized all the contemporary things that were kind of in vogue at the moment in jazz and said, yeah, well, this is my version of it, you know. <laughs> I'll maybe add one, one thing, Sam, to your, to your question. And I didn't hear this from Jackie, but I think I've read every, like, it's a dissertation now that was done by someone, I think, at Rutgers University. That's really excellent. I think you'd find it online. Uh, this fe fellow, Chet Williamson from Wooster, has written a biography. Uh, Anyway, I think from those sources, I've heard a lot about his parents. So his parents were both musical. His father played the trombone. I think I somewhere have a picture of his father playing the trombone. That I've his seen. Grandmother played piano. And uh, his mother played the piano. He also talked about, I think it was an aunt who played the piano for silent movies. I mm -hmm. could be forgetting about mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think they were definitely his mentors, his, his parents, his family. And I, yeah, I would also say, you know, he played those famous pieces with Mingus, F.W., you know, Fats Waller, mm -hmm. um, A.T., Art Tatum, where he, I mean, it was really his own piece, European episode, kind of done in this style. But he, you know, I, even though I don't think they were his, you know, teachers in the official sense, uh, you know, he's one of the few pianists of his generation who could could do that and then also play like Herbie Hancock or like Chick Corea to go back to what Jed was saying. I mean, he was really uh, like a sponge, I think, in that way. There's that one video of him playing duet with Earl Hines and you can see him softboxing his mentor like, mm -hmm. he's, I see him pulling his punches, nah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hit you in the jaw really hard, but they have a thing, right? Because he knows that Earl Hines turns, flips the whole script about what the piano can do. 
and Jackie realizes, oh no, that's what I need to be going for. So there's just that one video, but the records too, but the video you get to see, you get to see the student teacher thing, which is really clear in how Jackie looks at Earl Hines playing across from him mm -hmm. with the drummer. It's one of the most beautiful videos about transfer of knowledge in, 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 in public too, on a concert. But Jackie is soft jabbing. He ain't going for the throat because he knows he got respect <laughs> for Earl Hines. <laughs> but I know he could. <laughs> So I have one question that came online, and then we should probably wrap this up. But if you had the opportunity to say the one thing to Jackie now, what would you say? I wish I'd listened more. <laughs> I'd just say thank you. Yeah. Yeah, same thing for me. Thank you, really. Anyone else from the audience? I know some, many of you know we knew Jackie. Um, all right, well, maybe I should wrap it up. Thank you. I want to thank the Office of Advancement for their help in organizing this. Uh, thank you for our panelists, oh, Carl Atkins, <laughs> Jason Moran, Jed Levy. I should also say, they're all involved in the concert this evening at 7.30 while we'll be playing Jackie's music. Uh, so I hope you can make that as well. Uh, Thanks, Ken. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. Thank you, Ken.